Hi, I'm Nafisa Latic and this is Across the Balkans. Today on the show, we look at the unfolding situation in Moldova's breakaway region of Transnistria. Moldova's Defense Ministry has ordered the mobilization of all adult males after a series of explosions hit the separatist enclave in late April. Authorities in Tiraspol blame the blasts on neighboring Ukraine. Kyiv has accused Russia of launching the attacks to further destabilize the region. The uncertainty has sparked growing fears that Moldova could be dragged into the Ukraine conflict. The Moscow-backed separatist region declared independence from Moldova in 1990 as the Soviet Union was falling apart. Shortly after a war broke out between Moldovan forces and Transnistrian separatists backed by Russia. The war ended with a ceasefire that has remained in effect for 30 years, leaving Transnistria to run its own affairs as a de facto state, but without international recognition. Not even Russia has recognized the region as a state, but many of its residents identify themselves as Russians. We will ask what's next for Transnistria's future in a moment, but first, let's take a look at this report. The Russian attack on Ukraine has brought back painful memories in Moldova's east. The land between the river Niesta and the Moldovan-Ukrainian border, better known as Transnistria, broke away from Moldova after a war in 1992. Now, with a conflict next door, there are fears that Moscow could have aspirations also in this region. Thirty years later, the Moscow-backed region status is still unresolved. 1,500 Russian soldiers are stationed in the area, and President Vladimir Putin wants to keep them there. Despite being dependent on Russian gas, Moldova takes a very different approach to the situation. So we are a neutral country by constitution. Unfortunately, we do still have the Russian troops on our territory, and this is one of the important issues on the agenda with Russia, the withdrawal of the Russian troops and the withdrawal of the munitions that are still in transition. But as a country that's kept its neutrality for years, Moldova applied for EU membership in March. Despite being unrecognized by any state, the Pridnestrovian Moldavian Republic has its own constitution, flag, anthem, parliament and currency. The de facto government is militarily and economically backed by the Kremlin. And most of the 400,000 residents identify themselves as Russians. In 2002, Russia started to issue passports for the people here. It also provides financial help for the region's pensioners. An independence referendum in 2006 recognized neither by Moldova nor the international community reaffirmed the region's devotion to Mother Russia. Transnistria is rampant with corruption, money laundering, crime and illegal arms sales. Besides this reputation, the region has recently hosted Ukrainian refugees, a situation that brings fear to some residents. As one of the frozen conflicts of the post-Cold War era, Transnistria now fears the sparks of another nearby conflict. And as for who is the aggressor, the saviour or the victim, the region has no clear answer. My guest today is Vitali Marinuca, a security and defense consultant who formerly served as defense minister of the Republic of Moldova. Marinuca, Vitali, thanks so much for being our guest on Across the Balkans. How worried are you about the security situation in your country at the moment? 
thank you very much for the invitation. Of course, when we have a war not so far from the Republic of Moldova and from our border till Odessa are just 160 kilometers, you cannot stay calm and the people are worried. But uh, the situation is not so difficult yet within the Republic of Moldova, even we have an enclave in the eastern part of our country, so-called Transnistrian region, where are about 1,500 of Russian troops. So we hope that uh, for the future we'll have this uh, relatively calm situation and uh, we'll not get uh, we the have war. Seen, out we have seen explosions in uh, Transnistria region. Um, Ukraine and Russia both have denied any involvement uh, in those uh, attacks. Uh, who do you think is behind these strikes near the border? From my uh, perspective, I think uh, the, these explosions were planned and implemented by the security services, uh, probably, uh, most probably military intelligence of the Russian Federation with uh, its proxy, proxies from the Transnistrian region, because no one um, can benefit from uh, those explosions, just uh, Russia. In addition, they were from the professional point of view, they were uh, professionally good organized, but um, uh, in such a way that they will not uh, inflict any damages. And uh, if we talk just about one thing, the antennas, which are really uh, very important for, for Russian propaganda, those antennas are from the Soviet Union, and uh, they are only 16 on the territory of the former Soviet Union, and they can broadcast even to Latin America. So in uh, two days, the broadcasting started again. So I would say that the um, Russian Federation wanted to uh, achieve a couple uh, things. First of all, maybe to uh, turmoil this region. Second, to make uh, Ukrainian uh, take some troops from the Donbass region. And uh, the last one, uh, is uh, to to make Republic of Moldova war and to make some uh, mistakes uh, and But if uh, it's bring... true if it's true what you are saying then Russia really is behind these attacks what purpose do they serve uh, why would Moscow do this while it's already fighting and taking heavy losses in Ukraine at the moment You know Russian Federation always wanted to to have not only Ukraine but but whole uh, former Soviet Union uh, uh, republics, now independent countries. So we can look into the declaration with the high military commanders, as well as high political commanders, or uh, high political uh, leaders of Russian Federation, uh, that uh, Republic of Moldova is under threat from, uh, uh, from their uh, attacks. So I think uh, one of the aim of those attacks were to have Ukraine take some uh, forces from the Donbass region and to dislocate them into the into Transnistrian uh, or cr cross border of Transnistrian region of the Republic of Moldova. We shall not forget that there are 1,500 troops. Yes, not too many, but still they can inflict some damages or can mount a small, I would say, unsuccessful yet attack uh, into the Ukrainian uh, land. Plus, we have the uh, very big storage of uh, ammunition, one of the biggest in Eastern Europe. So they can use those uh, uh, armaments, uh, shells. So you are talking about today. exactly. You are talking about about the largest ammunition depot in Eastern Europe, the one in uh, Kobasna. But what if an explosion hit uh, this depot? Are we looking at the blast like the one we've seen in Beirut? And in Beirut, only two thousand tons were stored, and we are talking here about twenty thousand tons of ammunition in Kobasna at the moment. Yeah, we are looking at the blast uh, about 10 times um, uh, bigger than uh, in Beirut. According to one of the studies that uh, was uh, completed in 2005 by our Academy of Science, 
But uh, at the moment, uh, uh, we cannot say for sure how much there. But we know that it's one of the biggest uh, uh, ammunition depots in uh, Western Europe. And there are some uh, uh, ammunition which were taken from the in, in the 90s from the former Democratic Republic of Germany and Czechoslovakia. And in the last 20 years, uh, none of the observers from the international community or from the Republic of Moldova were allowed to come here. So the Academy of Science was, said, uh, was saying that um, if the uh, blast will be in on this depot, so we'll have the damage for 4.5 kilometers, nothing will remain there, and uh, the big damages will be for about 50 kilometers, which is a, a huge damage uh, for the region and not only human, but also uh, ecological damage too. Right, I can just imagine the fear that people are, are, are feeling at the moment, having in mind all the, these things that you've just said. Uh, let's listen in now together what Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said about the Russian troops based in Moldova. Their special services have been working there, and it is not simply for the sake of fake news. It is clear why to destabilize the situation in the region, to threaten Moldova by showing it what steps will be taken if Moldova continues to support Ukraine. As for the Russian troops permanently stationed on the territory of the temporarily occupied part of Moldova, Transnistria, for many years, we know they are on permanent standby, waiting for this or other marching orders, but we know their size, and the Ukrainian armed forces are ready for them and are not afraid of them. Why is this region specifically emerging as a new possible flashpoint uh, for the conflict in Ukraine? Well, it's just because the Russians have already their uh, 1,500 troops, as I mentioned, and the, the separatist so-called government, which is backed for the, for the last 30 years by the Russian Federation, can mobilize also their so-called armed forces, which is uh, about 6.5 uh, thousand uh, population, maybe to bring uh, under the arms another uh, 10 to 12 uh, thousand uh, people, which makes about 20 thousand. But uh, the Ukrainians have a two fully armored brigade uh, on the border. So I think I, I can agree with uh, President Zelensky that the uh, uh, Ukrainians are ready just in case. Uh, Russians will decide to use those forces from the temporary occupied territories of the Republic of Moldova. Nevertheless, I believe that the Russian Federation will not uh, involve those forces until they will not get to Odessa. But this is something that uh, cannot occur soon because Russian Federation doesn't have manpower, doesn't have uh, now uh, military capabilities to get uh, through Nikolai, also to get through uh, three rivers, to pass through rivers, to get to Odessa. Also, they have problems... Um, on, of, April, uh, uh, on April 23rd, uh, a senior Russian military official said the second phase of what Moscow calls its special military operation included a plan to take full control of southern Ukraine and improve its access to Transnistria. Well, this seemed like an indirect threat to Moldova. Uh, what would this mean for the future of the region and what do Russians need to take first to get there? I think this is uh, um, not, it's indirect threat from the military point of view, but we have even more threat from uh, Lavrov, uh, Russian uh, foreign minister, which actually a couple of days ago said that uh, Moldova has to uh, have some concerns about its future. Uh, because somebody wants to uh, drag, drag us into NATO. It was the same rhetoric as uh, it was before invading Ukraine. So yes, we have to, to worry about... Uh, plus, uh, we know that on the May 5th, the European Parliament actually backed a resolution which gives the Republic of Moldova clear perspective for European integration, and that's why Actually, the Russian Federation has in mind uh, taking Moldova, but they don't have yet capability to, to make it militarily. For sure, they will use our 
We say it's fifth column, the inside support of the Russian Federation, which is the uh, uh, Communist and Socialist Party, the enclave or Gagos, uh, enclave from the south part, which are actually supporting Russians too. But we, we've seen on the 9th of May that uh, these uh, uh, forces, inside forces, are not so big. So for now, uh, I think Moldova has to take care in the near future about this threat, but it's not an imminent I want one. To, I want to bring in now Moldova's Prime Minister's reaction too. She is demanding the withdrawal of the Russian troops. Uh, let's listen in what she had to say. The Republic of Moldova uses the platform provided by the UN to demand the withdrawal of foreign troops of the Russian Federation from the territory of the Transnistria region of our country and to draw attention to the violation of human rights allowed in the region controlled by the unrecognized regime. The fact that these topics appear in UN resolutions keeps Transnistria's problem in the field of the international community. What do you make of the Moldovan government's reaction to the latest developments? What do you think needs to be done swiftly to protect Moldova's sovereignty and the country's future? As we know, people are scared and unsure when and could the next blast come in the region? For the last 30 years, uh, the, all the governments of the Republic of Moldova were asking uh, at the all level, at the highest international level, U United Nations platform for the withdrawal of uh, Russian troops. But uh, nonetheless, the Russians never uh, listened to, to those demands. Uh, so now, the um, Republic of Moldova, being a neutral kind country by constitution, try to stick to this neutrality. Even though I believe that uh, our neutrality was violated by the Russian Federation for, for all 30 years, but especially now when it became an aggressor. So as the chairman of the speaker of the parliament last night in one of the show mentioned that uh, if it will be the case, Moldova will ask its partner for, for help. I believe we don't need to uh, wait until the case will be, until we will get invaded, we need to ask now, as a neutral country, as a country which was uh, treated already by, um, by Russian officials, uh, politi political officials, as well as military officials. Uh, so we have to ask for uh, defense capabilities to, uh, to prepare for an invasion, just in case. Yes, even now, it's not, it's not this case. Russians don't have these capabilities, but it seems that they have this intent. And our army has limited capabilities. It's not so big for the, for the last 30 years. Most of the governments, they were uh, saying that we are neutral, so did not invest as much as was needed in the militaries. So now, I think uh, the only way is uh, for us to prepare uh, mentally, just in case, and uh, ask for help uh, inclusively, I believe, uh, lethal weapons, defense weapons too. Uh, Vitali Marinuca, a former defense minister of the Republic of Moldova, our guest today. Thank you so much for your insight. It's time to look at some other stories making headlines in the region this week. Bulgaria has announced it will not support EU sanctions against Russia if the country is included in a proposed ban on buying Russian oil. Deputy Prime Minister Asen Vasilev has requested an exemption, saying if other countries are excluded, Bulgaria wants to be exempted too. Hungary, Slovakia and the Czech Republic, which all depend heavily on Russian crude oil, have also asked to be excluded from the ban. The European Commission proposed the changes to its initial planned embargo on Russian oil to give the three countries more time to shift their energy supplies, while Bulgaria was not offered concessions. Serbian President Aleksandar Vucic is threatening Kosovo, saying it will give a strong response if the country moves forward with its application to join the Council of Europe. The statement came two days after Vucic met Kosovo's Prime Minister Albin Kurti in an effort to revive EU-facilitated talks to normalize relations between the two. 
After the meeting, Kurti announced his government would apply for membership to the Council of Europe and NATO's Partnership for Peace program. Bosnia and Herzegovina has announced the date for its presidential and parliamentary elections. As set for October 2nd, the announcement comes amid ongoing disputes over electoral reforms. Around 3.4 million registered voters will elect Croat, Serb and Bosniak members of the presidency. Croats are warning of political consequences if the vote is held under the current election law. Voters have argued that it would be a direct threat to peace and political stability if the country, which is already going through its worst political crisis since the breakup of Yugoslavia and its following wars in the 1990s. The First Lady of the United States, Jill Biden, paid a visit to the Romanian capital Bucharest. There, she met a group of Ukrainian refugees and with U.S. and NATO military officials stationed in the country. Biden, who teaches English and writing at a community college in Virginia, also made a surprise visit to Ukraine, where she met the country's first lady, Olena Zelenska. She made the visit to Western Ukraine as part of her European tour. Around 900,000 Ukrainians have fled to Romania since Russia launched its attack in late February. And Croatia has lifted all entry requirements for international visitors as it gears up to prepare for the upcoming tourism season. Now people can visit and also travel to other Balkan countries without any restrictions. Croatia's scenic coastline is a popular destination for many international travelers. Its tourism sector alone makes up 20% of the country's GDP. Croatia becomes the latest country in the Balkans to lift all of its COVID-related entry requirements. Bosnia is the only country left in the region that still maintains some restrictions. The region definitely needs a good and lucrative tourism season this year. That's it for this week. Thanks for watching. We'll leave you with some beautiful pictures of Eid celebrations across the Balkans. Bye-bye for now. Eid is for the all of mankind a celebration of goodness, celebration of well-being. And we hope with the Eid uh, gathering everywhere in the world uh, to achieve peace, to achieve prosperity. Poroka je uvijek, uvijek ista, iskreno, mir, 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 samo mir. Watch and create the bottle. Watch and my squad in Vandenton, Messenton, and Monday create the bottle.